As industrial economies emerge from the pandemic, demand for energy is soaring, and with it, energy prices. That's angering vulnerable consumers and worrying governments. Fossil fuels, power, costs are exploding, driven by record high demand. Here in Europe, natural gas is six times more expensive than at the start of the year. Energy markets and firms are ratcheting up prices, and at least in the case of Russian monopolist Gazprom, resisting calls to expand supply. As countries consume larger amounts of alternative fuels like coal, CO2 emissions are also rising, exacerbating the climate crisis. Our topic, bleak winter ahead. Who's to blame for Europe's energy crisis? Hello and a very warm welcome to To The Point. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Malte Kreuzfeld is economy editor with the Berlin daily newspaper, The Taz, and his opinion is, to reach our climate goals, fossil fuels will have to become even more expensive. We must switch to renewables the sooner, the better. And it's also great to have with us Christoph Berger. He works with the Berlin-based European School of Management and Technology, ESMT. And he says Russia's Gazprom is a global firm that is simply trying to maximize profits. It's the job of European policymakers to ensure sufficient competition on energy markets. And joining us from Paris is Thierry Bross. He is a energy expert and professor at Sciences Po University. And he believes it doesn't make sense to switch from nuclear to renewable energy, as Germany does, because it entails higher CO2 emissions. So let me get everybody's take on how bad the current crisis is. And Malta, uh, Europe, of course, is not alone in this crisis. Some experts are predicting the crisis could come to rival the shortages that were experienced in the 1970s with the OPEC oil embargoes. Do you think that's right? I wouldn't think so. Actually, I think um, the problem might be exaggerated a little bit in some of the media reports. If you compare the prices for this year, you see a steep increase in oil and gas prices, that's true. But if you look on a longer scale, if you look at the last 10 or 15 years, then you see that we are coming back to the level now that we have had um, between 2010 and 2016 already. So uh, you could also say we have had very low energy prices in the last four years, and compared to that, it's now high. But this expectation that energy should always stay cheaper than it was in 2012 is not really very realistic in my opinion. Of course, this sharp increase now is a problem for consumers who have problems paying, paying their bills if they have low income. But in general, I feel we should like put the things into perspective. And if you look at a longer perspective, it's not as bad. And it's also compared to last year, the steep increase where we had the corona crisis and econo economic um, uh, uh, things were down. Now everything's picking up even higher I want even to come back to the before. causes yeah. in just a moment, but if I can just briefly pick up on your opening statement. Yeah. You said that we must switch to renewables and for that we need to let energy prices rise. But the fact is many countries are making that switch, are transitioning out of fossil fuels. So it seems counterintuitive that just at this moment prices go up. Well, um, Prices, Normally, if uh, price, demand is, is, is going down, you would see prices decline. Yeah, but demand isn't going down that much yet. Huh? So at the moment, we see a rising demand worldwide and um, a limited sort of uh, uh, delivery. So uh, we have, at the moment, higher demand than what is delivered in, to, in terms of gas, especially to Europe. So that's natural that you see rising prices then. But in general, over the time, the, um, it, it will go down. But prices will still be high because, I mean, we have the emissions trading systems here. We have the CO2 price, which makes it more expensive. And also maybe um, the uh, um, Gazprom will also try if it's clear that, the, that it's a limited time where they can earn money with that to get as much out of it as possible. We're coming right back to that. But let me go over to Paris, to Thierry. And if you would just unpack the causes for us, uh, please. Uh, to what extent is the current crisis, the rise in prices, attributable to extraordinary factors like extreme weather, supply chain disruptions brought on by the pandemic? And to what extent is it simply bad policy? 
I think it's mostly bad policy. I think what we are missing in the energy transitions are two things. It's the energy storage and it's the education of the uh, population. And as long as we haven't done this, uh, we can put as much renewable as uh, we want. If we don't have storage, then there will be intermittency and then we will need to uh, use gas and coal to burn and to uh, make this electricity that otherwise isn't coming. So I would say it's mostly bad policy or at least it's having a policy that we wanted to be too fast. Uh, Kustav, many fingers are pointing at Vladimir Putin, uh, as was mentioned by Malta, and we will delve into that shortly. But Putin himself says Europe's crisis is self-inflicted, that essentially European policymakers bad made bad choices. Would you agree? Uh, partly yes, partly no. Um, um, let me say no, because I think the, the increase of gas prices to a certain extent is simply driven by the current situation. Yeah, we had the corona crisis, then you have to ramp up. Basically, the storage uh, facilities aren't uh, filled as in past years. And that was very difficult for any company to predict, right? I mean, what kind of volumes do you expect? So that's one part. The other part, yes, bad policy. To some extent, I agree to that, because if we look from a European perspective, we need to diversify our supply structure. And as Thierry just mentioned, we also need to think about storage capabilities. Uh, but storage capabilities might be seasonal capabilities, so a little bit more large scale. But of course, we will see a lot of innovation coming in decentral storage capabilities like batteries. And that we need to keep into account. So we face an energy future, which is highly uncertain. So we are phasing out large scale. And uh, we are getting more and more decentralized sources. And at the same time, basically, we switch from fossil to renewables. And we have to live with that uncertainty. So in other words, we need more backup uh, sources of supply than the EU has been, has been planning for. Um, the EU apparently decided that it could rely on liquefied natural gas imports, on spot energy markets, short-term energy markets. Is that where the failure lies? Lies? I think it's not only LNG terminals. It's a little bit, and, and that is uh, what I try to say with the mid or long term uh, perspective of the energy transition. Even if you build now these large infrastructural projects, they take, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years. And in 10, 15 years' time, we will see a completely different energy landscape. You think about e vehicles, you think about decentral storages, you think about that you produce and consume your own electricity. And then when you now establish these large infrastructure projects, they might look very nice, but the question is, will they be able to recoup their, their investment once they are alive in 10 or 15 years? And this is really uh, very difficult and is uh, highly uncertain, I would say. Speaking of big investments, let's drill a bit deeper on the German-Russian natural gas pipeline Nord Stream 2. It has long been a bone of contention. Germany insisted on finalizing this very, very expensive project despite pressure from other EU members and the US, which argued that the project would deliver Germany's energy security into Vladimir Putin's hands. Are the critics being proven right? Following years of construction and billions in investments, the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline is now finished. It directly connects Russia's natural gas storage facilities with Germany via the Baltic Sea. Germany buys more than half of its natural gas supplies from the Kremlin affiliate Gazprom. Critics say the new pipeline will increase dependency on Russia. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has always supported the project. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has distanced himself from the accusation he is using natural gas as political leverage. She hasn't accused us of anything because we both assume that the pipeline is an economic project. The U.S. has a different view. It temporarily imposed sanctions on companies that participated in the pipeline's construction, partly as punishment for interfering in American elections. Poland, as well as the Baltic nations, also fear that Europe is becoming increasingly politically dependent on Russia. The energy business, is it really just an economic project? Let me put that question straight away to Thierry. Thierry, certainly the gas shortage is now being used by the Kremlin to tout the need for Nord Stream 2. Does the crisis uh, offer definitive proof that, in fact, this pipeline always was a political project? 
I, I think any any energy project is a political and an economical project. I, w- I would disagree with what I said earlier. I mean, I don't think we need more infrastructure. We, in this case, need more supply. And in, in the case uh, of this crisis, the infrastructure is there. We have the Ukrainian transit. Uh, uh, and maybe there is some extra supply available in gas from hands, and they are not uh, using it because they are not interested in using it. But I don't think... Uh, this will solve the the crisis, and, and I don't think it can even solve the crisis in terms of timeline. The, the other thing I'd like to add is the fact that um, we there is this dependency, and we call it interdependency or dependency. But I think what we have to keep in mind is with today's record high prices, what we are doing in Europe, uh, and, and as you said, it can be bad policy or it can be t- uh, weather or whatever. We are pushing ten billion dollars per month to uh, uh, the Russian state, extra. So I think those are the uh, kind of elements you have to think. So it's not only political, it's economical, it's geopolitical. Malta, is there clear evidence of market manipulation on the part of Russia and Gazprom? Clear evidence, I can't say, because I don't have, like, primary access to that. But uh, what... and. Everybody says they are fulfilling their obligations. What was agreed before, they are doing that. But at the moment, there's higher demand than that was agreed on before. And apparently, they don't fulfill those because they say, if you want more, then uh, let the new pipeline go into operation first. So we will only give you more gas if you, if you start Nord Stream 2, which they don't say that clearly, but the message seems to be quite clear. There is more capacity in the pipelines that come through the Ukraine or the southern one, the Yamal pipeline. There would be capacity, so it's not a problem that there isn't enough gas available. It's not a problem that there isn't enough pipeline capacity. They want this pipeline because they don't want to give share money with the Ukrainians anymore for the transport, and they don't want them to be have the strategical um, uh, importance that they are needed for the transport. So it's really a, a, not an economic thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a power thing concerning international relations. So, Christoph, your opening statement said that Gazprom is simply looking to maximize profits like any other company. Uh, does that really make Nord Stream a purely commercial project? Uh, let's say Gazprom wants to maximize profits, but clearly the Russian state also has an interest in this project. I think I can't um, comment on any political background because they simply don't have enough information. If I look from an economic perspective, um, Gazprom is an international company. They try to optimize their profits. There is Europe as a market and there's Asia as a market. And Europe wants to diversify. Asia has a huge demand for gas. So therefore, of course, you try to balance those customer groups. From a European perspective, I think it's very important that we create a a living playing field of different technologies. And the broader we set that up, the more independent we are, and the better is our negotiation position for any kind of situation that we are facing right now. But isn't it indisputable that if Nord Stream 2 goes into operation as planned, as a a project between Germany and Russia, that it ultimately increases both Germany and Ukraine's vulnerability to Vladimir Putin's whims? Well, I would... uh, if If we think about Germany, then we have an additional capacity for gas. And that is, within the energy transformation, not a bad thing to have still keeping in mind that we need to diversify our supply structure and there are many different opportunities like renewables or storage solutions and so on. Uh, So I think we need to keep that in mind. And uh, I would uh, say that this is the key priority that we start thinking a little bit more mid or long term. We have an energy transition in front of us. We want to be net zero in 2050. So let's think a little bit about backward. How will the energy landscape look like in 2015? You would assume that you can produce, you can consume your own electricity. Do we need a lot of regulation? I don't know. So then basically the question is, how can we ease up those markets and that there is a path that enables innovation? We will see many different new business models and uh, that we can help them and then we have a look at those people so that we do not lose them if prices are rising within that energy transition. I want to come back to that last point in just a moment, but let me let me go now uh, to Thierry. And the fact is, uh, Thierry, France has long opposed Nord Stream 2, along with other EU members as well. Um, it now seems to have allies in at least two of the political parties that are likely to be part of the next German governing coalition. So what would Paris want to see from a 
a new German government when it comes to Nord Stream 2? Well, uh, perhaps I'd like to answer the first question you've uh, said earlier. I mean, Ukraine is going to uh, be negatively affected, that's for sure. Uh, and on, on the French system, you're right. I mean, some in France were against, uh, but again, remember, uh, NG was is part of of this uh, of, of this type. So I think what what the French situation perhaps now is more aligned with the European situation, which is against this type, because this will be negatively, which is will impact negatively Ukraine. So I think this is really what what what's now here. And again, we've seen the U.S. putting sanction. We've seen the U.S. removing sanction. Uh, we are going to see what the German government, whatever the new German government will do vis-a-vis -vis Nord Stream 2. But for me, I mean, this pipe is not going to be up and running very soon anyway. Malta, what would you expect to happen now with Nord Stream 2? Should it be put on pause right at a moment in time when Europe is desperately thirsty for natural gas? Well, as I said, I think the thirstiness for gas has nothing to do with uh, Nord Stream 2 because there is other pipeline capacities available, so you don't need Nord Stream 2. We didn't have it before. We never had problems in winter, so there are enough pipelines. But I still feel that um, the expectation that the new government will stop it is not very realistic. I feel there was a chance to stop it when the U.S. imposed the sanctions. That was a mechanism that actually would have been able to stop it if they would have sticked with that. But um, after Biden gave in to Merkel on that point, I see now it's sort of a point of no return where you have these techno technological things where you sort of have to give this, uh, uh, this regulation uh, permissions so on. But in the end, I don't think that there's a real leverage to sort of stop it. Um, in the end, um, uh, Gazprom could even sell like the last bit of the pipeline that goes through European uh, land uh, uh, to somebody else, then they would be out of the whole regulative issue. So I think at this point where it's really finished, it's probably too late. I would hope so. I always was against this project and I uh, agree with, with the critics in France or in the US that it's a, a, geo, a geostrategical mistake and also an economic failure will be Imminent because it will never pay off because we won't need that much gas anymore if we want to become uh, climate neutral. So it's really a mistake to build this, pi uh, this pipeline, but now this mistake has been made and I don't see it as a very realistic perspective that it's not going to go into operation. Let's talk a little bit about what other energy sources uh, we might need. Uh, and the fact is that renewable energy, which Germany has very much been banking on, holds the promise of making energy systems both cleaner and more independent of unreliable fossil fuel producers. Yet, even green pioneers are still a long way from 100 percent wind and solar. Does that make nuclear power the bridging technology of choice? It will be a beautiful new world, one in which wind and solar energy keep industrial nations going. But the switch is not only expensive, it brings financial burdens for companies and private households, which is one reason for the current increase in energy costs. While Germany began dismantling its nuclear power plants after the reactor accident in Fukushima, Japan, other countries are continuing to rely on nuclear energy, which has cheap running costs and is CO2-free. Especially France. We need to develop new breakthrough technologies to further develop nuclear power. So-called small modular reactors are promising. They are much safer, and safety is a key issue in the debate on nuclear power. After various incidents in older nuclear power plants in the U.S., the Biden administration also wants to build small modern plants. Russia and China, too, are depending on nuclear power. Do we need nuclear power to meet the world's energy needs and climate targets? Let me put that question straight away to Christoph. Many people do, in fact, say nuclear is an absolutely crucial bridge to get to that green energy future. Are they right? And is there any chance at all that Germany would rethink the decision to phase out nuclear? I think the question has to be answered by the citizens of that country. And in Germany, we had social <clears throat> concerns that we exit nuclear energy, and I think we would still get the majority on that one. Um, when we think about alternatives or um, nuclear power compared to alternatives, so let me first say that basically if you build a nuclear power plant, that takes quite a while, so 10, 15 years. 
When then it's ready for operating, the question will be how will the energy world look like in 10 and 15 years? We will see a lot of innovation going on. And I would like to stress that for me, the disruptive factor is not the renewable part in the energy transition, but it's the part where you can produce and consume electricity on your own, so the decentralization part. And there is no one size fit all because each region is different. But for example, in Germany, we have one, um, one company, one person who offers a house that is 100% electric autonomous and 70% thermal autonomous. And you can rent that for 10 to 15 euros. So you have in here the rent, you have the heat, the electricity and an electric car sharing. And that would be a little bit a stretching idea, right? I mean, it's still quite expensive. Okay, in other words, uh, sorry, I'm just going to cut you off because we don't have a lot of time left on the clock. But what you're telling us is nuclear does not have a future in Germany. Let, is that right? Yes. Okay, so let me go to Thierry because nuclear definitely does have a future in France. And in fact, in this year that marks the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima natural nuclear power plant disaster, we seem to be witnessing a renaissance of nuclear power in many places. Why is it that France, the UK and other countries remain pro-nuclear when a country like Germany is so risk averse? Well, two things. What Christopher said is absolutely right. It needs to be uh, the citizens that decide. And there's always been a higher social license for nuclear in France than in Germany. I mean, uh, radioactivity, I think, was uh, discovered by Marie Curie in, in Paris. So I think that's the first point. The second point, but it, it, it's, it's important because uh, it, it leads to education. Second point is the fact that the intermittency of the renewable have, uh, has an impact. It has an impact on uh, the uh, backup. And we've seen here, I mean, it's because we didn't get enough wind that we had to use more gas. And I think this is also why we need nuclear in this energy transition. We did, I think, in nuclear, we need storage. And again, I understand Christoph saying uh, we, 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 have, we are going to see loads of innovation, but we can't bet everything just on innovation. Thank you very much. And uh, let me go uh, to Malta. You may speak, uh, if you like, to the nuclear point, but yes, I, would I would also like, like to. to come back to the title of our show, which is Bleak Winter Ahead, because the fact is, given the current situation, we are seeing rising energy prices likely to affect very vulnerable consumers in terms of heating for their houses, in terms of people who depend on their cars to go to work. Do we need to bring energy prices down, perhaps by foregoing taxes on fossil fuels that, uh, in fact, you say in your opening statement need to go up in order to get us to switch to where we need to be on CO2 uh, the uh, uh, neutral sources. Yeah, um, briefly on that, I think it wouldn't be a good idea to tamper with the energy prices now um, uh, for everybody. Um, if you have a problem with poverty, that people can't pay their electricity bills or their heating bills, then you have to do something against poverty and not change the energy prices, increase social uh, security, uh, increase uh, uh, welfare payments and so on, um, and also give support to people to sort of minimize their uh, energy consumption, help them invest in new um, uh, heating systems, in insulating their houses, in uh, better appliances where you need less energy. That's, that's the solution, not to keep using energy and just subsidizing it by the state. But I also would like to say something to the nuclear thing, because I really disagree with Thierry on that one. I think it's, it's neither a bridge, because nuclear power relies on running all the time and it's not really you can't turn it up and down technology it's a, wise it's a problem and also um, economically it's a problem they are meant to run almost all the time that's where all the calculations are based on and even with that it's not economical at all the nuclear power plants cost like the, the cost uh, uh, of the ones that are built now in france and flamanville and in, in in great britain the cost has uh, increased six, t six times by now. The building time has tripled and it's much more expensive than renewables. Even if you take into account that you need a uh, backup for these renewables, there's simply, I think this whole debate is, is not really based on, on reality in a way. And mm -hmm. I don't also see this renaissance because in the next 20 years, we will see the majority of the existing power plants, uh, nuclear power plants being shut down and a very limited number being built. And those won't pay off in the end unless you get huge subsidies from the state. So I think that's a dead horse. Let me come uh, again back to our title, Bleak Winter Ahead, and ask uh, you, Christoph, to avoid bleak winters in the coming years. You've told us a lot about the long-term perspective for energy, but staying in the short term right now and the next couple of winters to come, what do energy policymakers need to do? Top priorities. 
I think they should let the markets work and not interfere. And I think that this situation that we have right now is to a certain degree triggered by the current situation with the corona with ramping up. And they should focus on the mid and long term to set the policies and incentives right. And what about those vulnerable citizens? As he just said, so basically, if you think about poverty, then do a poverty program. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us. Thank you to Thierry in Paris. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Hope to see you soon.